Здравствуйте, меня зовут Дженнифер, и меня дочь Онечка. That means hello. My name is Jennifer, and this is my daughter, Anya. And the story that I'm going to tell you tonight is one of faith and phases. What does that mean? The phases of life that require you to have faith. Okay. So when I was a little kid, I pretty much always knew I wanted to be a mom. But maybe not in the typical sense. You know, I wanted to do it a little bit different because everything I do is different. I mean, it's just the way that I am. And my neighbors had adopted their son. And I, I was aware of that as a child, and I thought it was really pretty cool, right? You know, you save a child that's already here, that's been displaced due to no fault of their own. And I thought, wow, I kind of want to do that. That's pretty cool. Okay, so I go on with my life, right? And life is great. Between the years of 1990 and 2000, 10-year time uh, span, I had two serious relationships. Unfortunately, neither one of those men wanted to have kids, and I felt compelled. So, in 2002, little me decided I was going to start the process for adoption as a single parent. Pretty scary, right? And I decided I wanted to do international. Why? Well, I wanted a closed adoption. I didn't want to deal with family dynamics that you had when you adopted from the States. It may sound kind of cold, but it was just where I was at. So that same year, 2002, I met my then-to-be husband, and we finished the process as a married couple and completed all of the paperwork and did all of that to get a little boy from the country of Ukraine. See, because Jennifer had her heart set on a boy. I wanted a boy. So 2003 was spent doing paperwork. You have to do home assessments. We had to have a psychological assessment. Believe that, or I don't even know what that was. We had to have a financial assessment. We had to do all of this ridiculous stuff, right? And we get all of this stuff notarized, and then it goes to the Ukraine, and it gets apostilled, and then you wait. And we do all this. Well, the whole year that we're going through this, Things became really unsteady in the country of Ukraine. They were fighting with Russia, right? I don't know if anybody remembers this. It got really nasty. And it turned into the Orange Revolution. And it ended up that they, that they accused the Russian government of trying to poison the president of Ukraine at that time because they wanted to become independent, OK? So we're watching all of this happen from our little home in Black Forest. Yeah, Black Forest. Um, and what ends up happening is Ukraine gets shut down. You can't travel into Ukraine because once President Yushchenko got sick, they didn't know what was going on. They clamped everything down, and guess what that meant for us? I can't travel to Ukraine to get my little boy. And you know what we had to do by contract? We had to wait for six months before we could do anything. Dang. Six months is an eternity when you're waiting for a child. Because all that you think about is, what's happening? What are they going through? Are they getting enough to eat? Is everything OK? So at the end of six months, we were advised to change all of our paperwork over to Russia because things weren't any more settled with the country of Ukraine. OK, we'll do that. What does that mean? Well, gosh, guys, I'm sorry. That means several thousand more dollars. And everything has to be done again. And you have to submit it to Russia. OK, we'll do that. It's now 2004. The fall of 2004. So we do all of this. Get all of our paperwork done, saving all of our money, and we submit it, and we, gosh darn it, we're going to travel. I buy my airline tickets. I get the hotel rooms. We go get our travel vaccinations, and we get ready to leave. I quit my job. I was in healthcare an executive position in healthcare. I quit my job. I'm going to Russia. I'm getting my little boy. We get a referral. And what that means is they pick a child for you. You have to say, I want a child between this age. I can accept these following medical conditions. 
you name all of these things that you want, it's really kind of weird, right? It's like shopping, but you have to be very practical about what you can take on as a family. So we get a referral, and I open my email, and oh, you wouldn't believe this was the child of my dreams. A little boy named Sergei in Moscow. Couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. I was so excited. Had his paperwork sent off to, look, to be looked at by a doctor in New York. Perfect child. No sign of any fetal alcohol. He was healthy as a horse. So what do I do? I do the one thing they tell you not to do. I do the baby room. I buy clothes. I get a book autographed for my little boy with his name in it. And on 4.30, the night before we're supposed to travel, disaster struck. I get a phone call. No, you can't go. What do you mean we can't go? I don't understand what you're telling me. You can't travel because Russia has shut down. They don't want to comply with the Hague Convention, so you can't go. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. I just lost $5,000. I'm two years into this, and you're telling me I can't go? No, and you have to wait until we get another referral. Six months later, we're now in February, <laughs> February of 2005. Wow. We're now two years past what we thought would be the adoption and $20,000 beyond what we thought the adoption would cost. But, you know, I'm on this path. This is what I'm supposed to do. Get another email with a referral. I'm not feeling so great about it this time. Don't know why. So I open it up, look at the pictures, and immediately, oh boy, something's wrong. Two-year-old, Olyash, he's in Tomsk, in southern Siberia. Didn't smile, looked like he had fetal alcohol syndrome, didn't feel good about this. That's all I can tell you. I had a feeling this was not a good situation, but contractually, we have to go meet Olyash. So I buy our plane tickets, and I make our hotel reservations, only this time we do travel. And we get to Moscow, and from Moscow we fly to Tomsk, and we meet Olyash. And it's a disaster from day one. Now you have to understand, my husband at the time was 10 years older than me, he already had two kids from a previous marriage, and I was feeling guilty, right? Do I want to saddle him with a child that is going to be a lifelong project that I probably can't save? So we're dealing with this, and during that time, Russia is so famous for doing this. Oh, by the way, I hope you have another $12,000 because Olyaj has an older brother named Maxim who's six and you have to adopt both of them. You can't just take one because we don't split up siblings. What are you freaking kidding me? I'm almost out of money. We took a second mortgage on our house. Are you kidding me? We go the next day to meet Maxim, get in the car, Traveling down the road, we get stopped by the militia, armed militia. Not very nice, pretty stern, stops us, checks all of our paperwork, delays us by 45 minutes, scares the dickens out of us. We were scared to death. We finally end up traveling to a remote orphanage in southern Siberia. Now, when we pull up, you could tell immediately that it was poor. The building was broken down, trash outside. You go inside, it's damp and it's cold. We walk in, meet the orphanage director. She's a wonderful lady. And out comes this beautiful child. Dark hair, light eyes. Sorry. And you know what I remember about Maxime? He's a little emaciated. He's kind of small for his age. But he has on a shirt that's too big and dirty, but his pants are too small, and his shoes have holes in them. And all I can think of is I just want to love this child and make it better for him. But you have to hold it together. You know, you can't show emotion because they play on that. 
And so we spend some time with Maxime, and he shows us his room, and he shows us some English words that he learned, and he was trying really very hard to impress us because he wanted us to adopt him. And he colored some pictures for us, and he called me Mama. <laughs> And I had such a heavy heart because I knew if I could just take Maxime, life would be so good. But to get Maxime, we have to take Olej. And the more time that we spent with Olej when we went back to the baby home, it just got worse. He would rage. He was violent. He would throw fits that were beyond reactive attachment disorder. And there were some psychological issues with this child, and we made the heart-wrenching decision to decline the referral. You just don't do that. So I remember the terror on our facilitator's face when we said, you know, we just don't think we can handle this child with our family. And by law, they have to give us another referral. Well, the orphanage director was so mad. They were in the office screaming at each other, which sometimes that's hard to tell when you're in Russia because everything is, you know, they talk this close to each other and they talk really loudly, so you don't know if they're mad or just, you know. <laughs> but clearly they were, they were not happy. And um, that was the first time I really got scared thinking, you know, we've spent $35,000, and I may not get a child. I may have gone through all of this for nothing, and I just gave it up, and I gave it to God, and I said, you know, I'm trying to do what I think I'm supposed to do, so you just give me some direction. We ended up staying another week, and we got deathly sick the whole time, um, probably from stress, the cold, Siberia, you can imagine. This was in March. Uh, Siberia in March is not, you know, balmy. And um, after eight days, our facilitator comes to us. We were staying in her flat, and she comes to us, and she says, okay, I got a call from the orphanage director, and she's got one child for you. And this is the only child, because you didn't take that healthy boy you are not going to get a boy now. You're going to get a girl. And if you don't take this child, you can go home without. Wow. OK. So we go the next day to the baby home, not knowing what to expect. We travel in silence in the car. And we get there, and we're not treated nicely. They make us wait over an hour. They take us up to the room, finally, which is the playroom. They call it the playroom, where you meet the little kids. And we're sitting there in silence, and we just have really heavy hearts, because I don't know what's going to happen. You're around all of these little kids with cleft palates and fetal alcohol syndrome. And one story I, I, I remember just to give you an idea of what it's like outside of this country, we never knew if we were going to have hot running water every day. And the first day we were there, there was a human train of tiny little kids between 12 months and 16 months old that were all bundled up to go outside. And there was a staircase, two-level staircase, to get from the upstairs to the downstairs. And a group of about 10 little kids all holding hands. There wasn't an adult in sight on these fat little unsteady baby legs, some of them not so fat, come walking down the stairs holding the banister, doing this, you know, and watching in horror, waiting. If one of them falls, they all fall. And they got to the bottom of the stairs and waited and didn't make a sound. They didn't laugh. They didn't talk. They didn't run or play the whole time we were there. And they just waited for somebody to take them outside. So getting back to, we're upstairs in the baby home. We're waiting, remember? The door's open. And one of the staff comes in holding a child in her arms. Turns around, puts the child down, turns her back, closes the door. Really? We all sat there for about five seconds, all three of us, you know. Little tiny baby girl, 18 months old. Looks at us, we look at her. She starts screaming. 
little baby girl, black pants, black and white striped shirt. And I get up and I run to her. Oh, Nichivu, Nichivu, Mama's dies, Mama's dies, Nichivu. It's okay, it's okay, Mama's here. It's okay. And she immediately stopped crying. And I knew right then that was my chosen child. The rest of the time we were at the orphanage, we brought her treats, fruit, candy. All the other little kids would try to take what we brought her, so we'd sneak her things. And she laughed. She didn't say a word. She didn't speak the whole time we were there. She laughed, interacted with us. It was, we had to come back home. I had to leave her there. And it was six months later, that seems to be the magic number, before we could go back to get her, she'd already turned two. And so we missed her second birthday. But we went back, and my husband and I had to go in front of the Russian court and have a translator, and you have to answer all of these questions. And on April 9th, 2006, Shipinova, Olya, Alexandrovna became Anya, Olya, Christiana, Petrus. And she became my child. This is my chosen child. Thank you.